Good morning, everyone. Today, my guest is Keisha Gibson, a prominent and experienced management consultant specializing in the telecommunication space, as well as media and technology sectors. She has over 20 years of experience across both senior management consultancy and line management roles. She has provided executive stewardship to the C-suite for several global companies. Her mission is to deliver the fundamental shifts needed to steer telecommunications from siloed industry to being part of a broader and more collaborative ecosystem. Keisha, welcome to the show. Thank you. You have led and continue to lead significant roles in competitive work environments. So I wanna start with your origins. How has growing up in a small island influenced your drive and determination? Good question. Um, so I grew up in Trinidad and Tobago um, and my family, most of my family is, is still there. I, I guess in Trinidad, we have a mix of British as, as, as well as American influences. And, and as part of that, you, you believe, or at least I was, I was taught to believe that the art of the possible is possible, if you know what I mean. I remember going to primary school and the, the, the teacher there asking me what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I said, oh, I want to be president of Trinidad and Tobago. So I always had some sort of drive and ambition to be in a role where I could, I could make a fundamental, a fundamental change. And obviously that was supported by how I was brought up with my parents. Uh, they pushed me to apply to the best of the best schools. And so I applied to Wharton in the US, got a full scholarship for that. And then the rest is pretty much history after that. With, with having that sort of foundation in terms of educational foundation, I was able to then broaden my thinking in, in terms of what I wanted to do in my career and, and use that to navigate various geographic as well as um, organizational uh, journeys. Really, really fascinating. You went to Wharton. What was that experience like? <laughs> Well, it, it's that was such a long time ago. I this was my second time ever being out of Trinidad and Tobago. So there were a whole load of different things happening at the same time, from being in a different culture to being away from my parents, and to being in a school where you you're in a school of some of the brightest people in the world and finding your place in that. Right. So it was a massive challenge. Of, of having quite intelligent people be around me and trying to find where I fit in the hierarchy. But what I really loved about that particular institution is that it broadened my ideas of what I could do. So I went in with a very fixed idea of wanting to be an actuary, believe it or not. I mean, me as an actuary would be... Uh, who, who, who knows what that would have looked like. But, but because of that system of education, they forced you, and I say that in the, the nicest of terms, they forced you to do a wide variety of, of, of courses. And that led me to realize how much I, I like business, how much I like marketing, how much I like understanding how to shape, shape run, and to make successful businesses. That's great. And would you say that, or what would you say were the traits that helps you to develop into the consultant you've become? Um, so there probably are qu quite a few traits. Um, uh, clearly some of it is, is, is cultural and wanting, wanting to be successful. Some of it is just a natural curiosity. I think being a consultant, at least, at least when you enter consulting, many consultants enter because they don't know exactly what they want to do, right? They're attracted by having many different projects, working with many different clients, and then perhaps seeing where they'd like to, to slot in. And what I realized was that I didn't want to slot in anywhere. I liked the idea of having a portfolio of clients, a portfolio of problems to solve, you know, across various geographies, which, which, which lends a, a, a sort of different um, take on, on, on the problems. And, and that just grew into, into, into who I am as a consultant. I eventually narrowed down, and that's probably not the right word, but I eventually started looking specifically around telecoms clients and more specifically around customer problems, um, which you, know, you and I as an everyday consumer can relate to. And just realize that there is a long list of things that need to be made better for both customers, which can be enabled by, by you know, my telecoms clients and, and technology. So it's really about making a difference to, to people who actually use those services. 
Yeah, for me, my career has always been um, doing something where I can make a positive impact. And the industry I've chosen is one that I believe is at the center of most industries. And, and, and clearly I'm, I'm a, bit, a bit biased in saying that. But if you think about your mobile phone, if you think about the stuff that you watch on television, that's all telecoms and media, and we all consume it. And it all then influences other things that we might do, right? What consumer goods we might buy, um, internet of things, how to use 5G, how to use 4G, et cetera. And so, and, and so for me, that's, that's always been something, uh, at least for the past 20 odd years, that I've been quite, um, quite involved in wanting to change and wanting to make and see them make a step change in how they uh, wow the customer and how they um, improve customer experience. Really amazing. So this is going to be the interesting question, as not as if any of them weren't interesting, but as a BAME, BIPOC, Black Caribbean, I never know what to call ourselves in, in this world of acronyms and, and short forms. But as a woman coming from a minority origin, what are the sort of challenges you faced and overcome in your journey? Yeah, that is an interesting question. And it's one that I've gotten probably more and more recently in the last year. And it's one that I have been thinking about more and more recently in the last year. So if I start from when I, I moved to Europe, I, I, I didn't have one of those titles or acronyms that you that you just uh, that you just mentioned because everyone in Trinidad is is either black or brown, right? So I was I, I I'd never considered myself to be uh, a minority, and and that to be fair has is how I've felt throughout my career. It's only when someone says something I think, right? Okay, I am different. Apparently, I am I am a minority, right? But but for me, it's it's how has it shaped me? It's just it's allowed me, I believe, to really value the differences in, in, in individuals, particularly differences in my team. And that's been a journey um, because I came from a certain way of thinking of how things need to be done and moved into this, this ecosystem or this environment, which is the UK, where I, I think if you spend enough time with an individual, you'd realize that they are we are all a minority of, of sorts, right? So there was a lady in my team who had never done consulting before. She's dyslexic, you know, that she is a minority. There's a British guy in my team who, you know, at a point in time when, when this wasn't the this wasn't the trend, liked to have his hair long, didn't like to shave it off, had a massive beard, you know, he's a minority. And, and what I think um, we've been taught, at least in the past, is that, right, we need to probably have a little chat with these people, right? We need to tell him why he needs to shave, because that's what he should do. We need to tell her how she needs to cover up that she's dyslexic, because that's what she needs to do. And actually, you know, as I became more uh, confidence in my career you just sort of embrace these differences and I think people feel when they can feel themselves at work they tend to excel a bit a bit more and so perhaps that's come from someone who was labeled a minority when they didn't think they were a minority I don't know if that makes any sense but uh, I, I think that's how things have evolved and at least in my mind instead of trying to get everyone in this sort of cookie cutter little box it's let's let's get rid of the lines and as long as we are aligned in terms of the vision the impact we're trying to make on the client let's just embrace the differences because you know people are more relaxed and they tend to be more successful and they tend to be happier absolutely would you say that it has in any way been a hold back for you this minority label you know that, that's a difficult question to pinpoint right um the answer to so i have felt on a number of occasions held back in my career um and it is hard to separate that from the fact that the first thing that you see is one i am black that's probably the first thing because my hair is short so you don't know if i'm a, a man or a woman and then the second thing is that is that i'm female and then the third thing if you hear me speak is that i have a, an accent that you might or might not be able to place right and these are all very important parts of me. Um, and so when I have been held back, those are some of the first things that come to my mind. Is it because I'm a bit different, right? Is it because I express myself in a certain way? Is it because I don't want to be held back? Because some in some cultures being held back is part and parcel of, of 
the next level. My culture isn't right. When you're ready, you are ready, and you are, um, and you are made to be to move to the next level. So I guess to answer your question in short, I would I would say yes. But but what I haven't done is I haven't let it hold me back. Right. And my career has been one where I haven't stayed in organizations where I didn't feel supported or that I've outgrown and I've made that part of my a part of my journey. I, I, I spend some time trying to understand why not. And then I spend some time understanding how to. And then, I mean, you know me, Kathy, and then I form a plan and and try to and try to get there. Absolutely. How do you maintain the balance between personal and work life? Because we know how competitive the industry that you're in is. How do you balance it all? Well, well, firstly, I, I personally don't believe there is a, a separation between work and, and personal life. I think if you do that, you, you end up living parallel universes and end up stretching your day beyond, beyond 24 hours. And it takes a lot of, puts a lot of pressure on yourself. So for me, they've always been intertwined, right? So that's why this, the, the industry I work in is one that I am hugely passionate about. The clients that I work with are ones that I get along with. They value me and they like me. There are lots of clients out there I imagine who probably wouldn't get along with me and probably wouldn't value me or I not them. I don't tend to spend my time trying to convince convince them of otherwise right so that work environment for me is one that is 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 very suited to my personality and similarly with the team or the people around me who are supporting me who I'm supporting as well that's that's part of what gets me you know gets me out of bed in the morning now on a personal level I love traveling have been to 112 countries and counting and I've managed to again um yeah, yeah, interwine that with my with my professional life. It wasn't designed that way, but even from when I had my first role at British American Tobacco, you know, I traveled most of the Caribbean and most of Central America. And then when I moved to Europe to do my MBA, I did a bunch of traveling then. And then when I worked for various companies like Deloitte, for example, I worked on every single continent except for Antarctica. So I was always ready to, to go and experience those cultures and and to and to see how I could help those other organizations and those other clients to to do something a bit different and to be a bit more successful. Wonderful. I'm certain that there are many women watching this program who want to be you. What <laughs> advice would you give them? Well, the first advice is don't want to be me. You don't want to be anyone else. I think um, uh, I, I learned this uh, probably late in my career that the most important thing is to be yourself, to be authentic, um, to back yourself and, and to know why, to know how much you are valued and why you are valued. Um, what's brought that to light for me was as part of International Women's Day, I opened up my calendar on, on LinkedIn and on Instagram and about 10 women that I had not met before slotted some time in, in my diary. And the one thing that was very, very common among them all, and they were all from different countries, amazingly, and different backgrounds um, and different professions. The one thing that was true to all of them was that they didn't see their value um, in the way in which I saw it in the space of a 15 minute conversation. For example, one lady said to me, she doesn't have a lot of work experience. She has a PhD, but she doesn't know how to get into the workplace. I said, you have what? A PhD? Are you kidding me? That is one of the most valuable things that, you know, most people who are interviewing you will be less educated than you are. So you need to walk into that interview thinking, you know, I'm super educated. I'm hyped up for this particular job. I want to make a difference. That PhD is an asset rather than thinking, wow, if I hadn't done the PhD, I could have had more work experience. And that's just one example, right? Each, each of these ladies took the one thing that someone was probably seeing in the, in the back of their minds and turned it into a massive obstacle as to why they couldn't get to the next level. So my one bit of advice is you have to back yourself first because even your closest allies might not be saying the right things to give you what you need to get to the next level. And secondly, just, you know, just don't give up on, you know, just, just pack the grit on, have a lot of grit that just keeps you focused on that, on that goal that, that, you, that you want to achieve. Wow, such a fascinating discussion. Thank you, Keisha, so much for the advice that you've shared. Any closing words that you'd want to leave our listeners with? Yes, um, 
I'd really want to encourage everyone to own their career. I've spent the last nine months thinking about where I want to be in the next 10 years. I've sort of written down what my value system actually is. I've looked for the types of clients that I think match both the value system and the type of content that I'd want to be helping to shape. And I've even used my clients, some of my closest clients, to test some of these ideas with them. And off the back of that, I formed a list of potential employers I'd like to work with or businesses I'd like to to be a part owner of. And I've used the last nine months to figure out how to get into these processes, how to shape the conversations with them. So they've been interviews, but they've been two way interviews and how to shape the best role for me and for that particular organization. And it's the first time I've actually spent the time to do that. And I really encourage those that have the opportunity to do that, to really do it. Just literally involve your entire ecosystem in in what's next for you career-wise and figure out that path to to, to getting there. Because I think we do need to own our careers, right? If we just wait for that LinkedIn ad, if we wait for someone to to give us a a referral, um, we we would end up where we need to, to actually be. So own your career. Thanks, Keisha, so much for that advice. And thanks for joining me on the show. Thank you for having me. And thank you for all your support in these last nine months as well and helping me to shape my thinking. Thank you. Thanks so much.